Welcome everybody to uh, our uh, Zoom call today. We had a number of questions that came in. So let's get um, right away. I think everybody on here has been on for a while. So we'll just jump right to the questions. We recently purchased a Beamer PEMF device. You've said PEMF devices are beneficial. Would you please describe what the benefit is? And in particular, if it is beneficial in cancer prevention. So I do have um, a number of web pages on the PEMF um, that talk about the benefits of the PEMF and the research on PEMF. <clears throat> now, that being said, um, there's really two different types of PEMF devices. So let's talk about that a little bit here. Um, let's go to uh, make that a little bit bigger. So, and a PEMF device is really measured on the Gauss output. That's the force of electrical pulse that's that the machine is putting out. There are two different types of PEMF device a low gauss PEMF device and a high gauss PEMF device. So a low gauss PEMF device is what the Beamer would fall under. Also, the um, there's other machines on the market. So the Beamer would be a low pulse, a low gauss PEMF. The IMRS is another brand of low Gauss PEMF. There's a number of other ones on the market that are professionally made low Gauss um, output PEMF devices. Um, a low Gauss output is something you will hardly feel the impact of it. The, the, the pulse of electrical impulse is going to be very low. You're not going to like feel this giant jolting impulse into your body. That's what you get with a high Gauss um, output. So these devices, um, there's a brand called Pulse. There's a brand called PEMF for life. There's lots of other professional brands that are high Gauss output. It is generally thought in the market that the high Gauss output devices are are more beneficial for serious diseases or injuries. The low Gauss output devices are more beneficial for if you don't really have anything serious going on and you just want to try to stay healthy and you're just trying to help ground yourself and help, um, you know, uh, just balance your energy. So what's the benefit of PEMF? Well, a couple of different benefits. PEMF does stimulate the nerves, uh, so it can help decrease inflammation at a site. But that's really mainly only the high Gauss units will do that. So P the high Gauss units can be real beneficial for injuries. So they would be good for like, uh, you know, you sprained your knee. They would be good for... You know, you hurt your ankle, you pulled a muscle. So injuries is, and this is the number one use of PEMF in our country is high Gauss output PEMF units. I'm talking about professional use, like in a clinic would be high Gauss outputs for musculoskeletal injuries. Very good for injuries because it can help decrease uh, inflammation. So they're good for that. That's the number one reason why PEMF is used in a clinical setting is for decreased inflammation to help um, improve the outcome of injuries, um, uh, damaged joints, et cetera, like that. High Gauss output machines are also going to add charge to a cell much more rapidly. So I'm talking the difference in numbers here. A low Gauss output would be a machine that I would define as maybe um, less than uh, 
uh, 2,000 uh, Gauss. That's what would be defined as a low Gauss output machine in my book. High Gauss output machine would be um, really 2,000 Gauss to uh, you know 40,000 Gauss. So the machine that we used in our office and we had patients come to our office was the Pulse brand. That's probably the number one brand. That and another one called Magnetronic brand. And the it put out about 30 to 35,000 Gauss. Like the Beamer puts out 700 Gauss. So that's the difference. The IMRS is less than a thousand Gauss. Uh, the Beamer is about 700 Gauss at its highest setting. So it's a big difference. What What is the difference? It's the amount of electricity that's going through there. So the benefit of a pulse electromagnetic frequency is the electrical impulse that can help recharge a cell. So your cell membranes um, act as a cellular charge, electrical charge for your body. That's part of what the cell membranes do. And when we get sick, our cell membranes can lose their charge. That can actually be measured. And that is not a good thing. So using a PEMF can be helpful for that. Is it specifically helpful for cancer? No, it's specifically helpful just for overall health. Is a PEMF uh, machine going to kill cancer cells? No, not at all. So it's not a cancer killing device. Um, at all. But increasing your cell charge, will that be better for your immune system? Uh, will that be better for your detoxification pathways? Will that be better for just cell health? Well, sure. So indirectly, they're good for any, anybody, regardless of whether you have cancer or not. And if a person already has a beamer, well, goodness sakes, use it. But if someone came to me and said, what type of PEMF machine would be best to purchase I would not say a Beamer. I would not say an IMRS. Now, plus it depends on your budget because the, the higher Gauss output machines cost more. So the Pulse machine that puts out 30 to 35,000 Gauss cost me $38,000. Well, not very many people can fork out $38,000 for a Pulse machine, but our clinic bought that. Um, now, the ones, the, the, the PEMF machines that we sell on our store to patients are um, uh, relatively would fall into the high Gauss output, but it puts out a maximum of about 6,000 Gauss. Well, those cost like $8,000, they're expensive. So I don't know how much you paid for your Beamer, but um, you can't get an IMRS. I think those are sold, um, you know, not through um, multi-level marketing type things. So I think you could get an IMRS for about three to four thousand dollars, but I think it's uh, equivalent to the Beamer. So I don't know how much you paid for the Beamer. Maybe you got it used and you got a good deal, or some friend gave it to you. I have no idea. But those are low Gauss output machines, and I don't think they're nearly as beneficial for cancer patients um, or somebody with any serious disease or somebody with. Um, like um, uh, peripheral neuropathy. So that's another really great use of PEMF is if I have peripheral neuropathy from chemotherapy. Well, the PEMF helps stimulate the nerves and can help heal the nerves so that it can help decrease per peripheral neuropathy symptoms. But the low Gauss output machines, they're not gonna have nearly the same benefit. So um, that's a little spiel on the PEMF. Unfortunately, um, a PEMF, whether it's low Gauss output or high Gauss output, the salespeople for these companies steal the research that was done on PEMF. All the research that's done with PEMF is done with high Gauss output machines, just so you know. So all the research that you'll find in the literature on PEMF and all the benefits are done with high Gauss output machines. And then the salespeople for the low Gauss output machines steal that literature and say, see, this is what the PEMF does. Look at all this research. Well, yes, it does, but that's not what a low Gauss output machine does. It's just, it's just the way it is. So I have IDC. 
uh, interductal carcinoma, uh, breast cancer. The past month, my breasts have been swollen and very tender. My legs are also swollen and I and have been for a few years. Is this indicating my lymphatic system is not draining properly? What can I do to alleviate this swelling? Lastly, do you have any recommendations for integrative oncologist, integrative MD in the Twin Cities metro area? Okay, so with um, swollen legs with uh, uh, swelling and increased tenderness in the breast, can this be um, an indication of the lymphatic system not draining properly? Yes, it can be. So what can you do to alleviate these? Well, there's lots of things. So let's talk about those lots of things. Um, so first of all, what you think about is doing things that um, will decrease swelling. So you could run the swelling program on the right. There's also a um, program that's called inflammation on the right. So run these right programs. They're in the um, alphabetical listings of the of the right that you'll find, and run those programs. So that's one thing that you could do. Also, understanding swelling and and uh, what it is, you want to you want to do everything you can to decrease inflammation through nutrition. So different nutrition that will help with swelling would be the flavonoids. So we're talking Boswellia. Uh, that's good for that. Curcumin, uh, that's good for that. Resveratrol, uh, that's good for swelling. Uh, uh, white willow bark, uh, EGCG from green tea um, uh, uh, extract, that's good for swelling. So anything that will, though these are the flavonoids that are also good for pain because so much pain is caused by swelling, they work for that as well. So nutrition that can help with that. Also to help with lymphatic detoxification, you can do lymphatic massages. So if you go to a massage therapist that's trained in cancer therapy massages, you can get a lymphatic massage. You can also understand, like we talked about this the last couple Zoom calls about the lymphatic system doesn't have a heart that pumps things through. So any type of exercises um, would help with um, lymphatic detoxification, even just muscle contraction, getting up, doing some leg raisers, going up on your toes. If you're sitting down, write the alphabet with your, with your, um, with your toes. Um, just contracting muscles helps with uh, moving lymph. So any muscle contraction is the key. Uh, uh, and so anything you could do that involves muscle contraction will help with motion. So getting up and doing some arm curls, um, you don't have to do barbells. You just need to do some little bit of calisthenics. That's going to help move things through. Um, an anti-inflammatory diet can be helpful, decreasing anything that could be inflammatory. How do we know if it's something that's inflammatory to me specifically? Well, then you got to think about things that may be foods that may be causing inflammation. Um, that you maybe have sensitivity. So you have antibodies to different foods. How do you know that? You could run a Cyrex test. That would be a Cyrex uh, array 10 panel. Or you could eliminate the most common things. One of the most common things that are inflammatory foods. Uh, that would be gluten, dairy, eggs. Think of things like that, meat. Um, well, I'm already on such a restricted diet. Okay, well then think of the things above that. So there's a lot of different things that you could do to help increase the lymphatic detoxification. Work on the liver, do hot packs over the liver, do coffee enemas. Um, 
Nobody wants to do coffee enemas. Coffee enemas can be really good to help you detoxify and get things moving. Do I have recommendations for integrative oncologists, integrative MD in the Twin Cities? Um, I don't, not that's integrative with cancer. There's some natural MDs um, in the Twin Cities, but they don't deal with cancer per se. So I don't have any integrative oncologist ideas. I don't know of anybody personally in the Twin Cities. And some questions come in on labs. Would you please comment on healthy cholesterol levels? I'm aware that pharmaceutical companies keep lowering the numbers to sell statins. Would uh, welcome knowing what you consider healthy levels. Mine are total cholesterol, 232. So what's a healthy level of cholesterol? Well, according to the pharmaceutical companies, you need to be um, less than 200. Some doctors want you less than 180. To me, that's ridiculous. And I think 200 to 250 is just fine. Matter of fact, cholesterol is a precursor for your uh, vitamin D formation. Uh, seven hydroxy cholesterol, I think it is, this is actually how you make vitamin D from the sun as it the sun rays hit your skin. <laughs> it needs vitamin, it needs seven hydroxy cholesterol in the skin in order to make vitamin D. One of the theories out there. Um, uh, is that, um, you know, everybody's reducing their cholesterol levels with statins. It's actually causing vitamin D deficiency. Um, I think I made that theory up, but I think it's good theory. So I think it's dangerous to reduce cholesterol too much. Matter of fact, it's said that uh, too low a cholesterol is actually an ominous sign for cancer. So, um, but if your cholesterol is 232, personally, I wouldn't worry about it. Triglycerides, a little elevated at 107. That speaks to, pot. you could have triglycerides elevated due to hypothyroidism. You could have triglycerides elevated due to inflammation, excess inflammation in your body at different things. So there's different reasons why triglycerides will be, will be elevated. Your LDLs are elevated a little bit. Um, it doesn't mean that you don't look at, um, you know, typically when you have elevated cholesterol and elevated LDLs, to me, your first, that is really a first sign of congested liver. Now, if a person has cancer and they have um, um, metastasis to the liver, that could explain some things. But most people, if they get to be 60 years old, they have a lot of congestion in the liver and different fatty liver disease that has never been diagnosed. And that is really an issue. So get back to coffee enemas and supporting your liver detox pathways, supporting bile production, all those are the kind of things that you would do. Uh, hemoglobin A1C 5.8, glucose 78, fasting, blood sugar 86. All those are good and within normal limits. So those are all good. Another blood work question from somebody else. Just got my blood work done and my calcium is low. So what could cause low calcium? Um, uh, so multiple um, non-pathological things could cause low calcium. I have breast cancer that have spread to the bone and they want me to increase my calcium to 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day and increase vitamin D to 800 to 10,000 um, IUs per day. Um, what brands do you suggest? Um, first of all, I would not. Um, so if I, if I had metastasis to the bone and low calcium, personally, I wouldn't take excess calcium. I would not take 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams a day. Matter of fact, there's a uh, multiple studies out that shows that when they started recommending 1,500 milligrams a day to women back in the seven, late 70s and 80s, um, uh, heart disease went through the roof in women, and it was due to uh, calcification plaque on the arteries, causing stiff arteries and increased blood pressure, 
and uh, cardiovascular disease. So taking uh, too much calcium can be dangerous. I think staying below a thousand milligrams a day of calcium is you know, is important. Um, also, you need to make sure that you're not taking the wrong type of calcium. Most calcium out there uh, is uh, calcium carbonate, um, and that is literally um, limestone. So limestone is found in the earth, it's found in the soil, and it's easy to wash and capsulize and sell it as a calcium supplement. And calcium carbonate um, does not absorb um, in your body. You hope it's not absorbing. It's not, it does not absorb well. And what is absorbed can will lay down in your arteries and will lay down in your um, ligaments and cause arthritic spurs. Calcium carbonate is not what you want to take. The only type of calcium, the only type of minerals that you want to take is our minerals that are chelated um, the way, so calcium carbonate is a chelation. So calcium is carbon is calcium is chelated to um, uh, carbonate CO3 or something, I can't remember. And, um, and that's how it's that's how it's found in nature. Plants take calcium carbonate and they actually change it to calcium lactate or a calcium that's double bonded to a um, amino acid. So either you take a um, so you want to take a calcium that's chelated as it would be found in nature. And in nature, I mean the way we're supposed to eat it. So we're supposed to eat plants. We're not supposed to eat dirt. So we eat plants. Plants take calcium carbonate. They change it to calcium lactate and calcium um, double bonded by, it's called bisglycinate. So it's typically, that would be double bonded to glycine, but it can be double bonded to other amino acids too. When it, you have a mineral that's double bonded to an amino acid, then it carries it carries it across the gut border very easily and gets it into the cell. You need your minerals to get inside the cell to do their work so the cells can use them. You don't want minerals not able to get inside the cells that just cause, that just act like almost like a heavy metal toxicity. And that's where if you eat, um, minerals, if you take minerals in a elemental form like that, you cause damage. That's why I'm not a fan of those liquid elemental minerals. That's not how we're supposed to take minerals. Um, and same thing with, you see that a lot with iron, you'll, um, uh, very similar, um, typically sold in a very poor form. So you want to take minerals that are chelated, with a double bond to an amino acid. And there's only a couple companies that make that that way. And those are listed as Albion Minerals um, and Trax. I think it's I think it's spelled that way. Minerals. Um, they these companies do not sell directly. So these are supplement companies, these are parent companies, you could say, of supplements that then sell to supplement companies. So supplement, uh, if you look at the back of a supplement and it says calcium, potassium, uh, magnesium, and then down below it says a Trax or Albion mineral uh, patented by Albion and Trax, um, then you know it's a really good supplement because these are double bonded as the same way they'd be found in nature to an amino acid so your body can use them. These are the only minerals that you want to take are the Albion and Trax. Um, all the companies that we have private labeled use Albion and Trax. So I personally wouldn't take, in the case if this was me and I had low calcium and I have metastasis of the bone, I would only take the clear multi min uh, plus. That's our Connors Clinic. Um, private labeled multivins. It doesn't have excess amount of calcium. It has a good balance of minerals the way you'd find it in nature. 
It's all albion and trax bound, double bonded um, amino acid minerals so that you'll use it just like you're eating really good plants. Um, that's the way you want your minerals. Your vitamin D, um, you could get uh, the vitamin D in the ADK um, that we have. So the ADK complete has got vitamin D, 5,000 IUs, and A and K. Um, and that is all your fat-soluble vitamins in one, and there's some benefits to getting all your fat-soluble vitamins in one thing. So and you, if you took two of those a day, you'd have plenty of vitamin D. By alkaline phos, uh, phosphatase, that's alkaline phosphatase, um, blood work was higher than two weeks ago, even after my infusion. So your infusion will not typically reduce alkaline phosphatase levels. Alkaline phosphatase is produced um, by your liver. So it can be due to liver congestion, but it's also produced if there's bony uh, lytic destruction of bone in the case of metastasis to the bone. So if the alkaline phos is elevated, it's due to the metastasis to the bone. It's not, it, it, it typically will not be reduced through, it, it's not gonna, uh, uh, infusion to increase your hemoglobin is not gonna help with your alkaline phosphate taste levels. So the other thing I wanna speak to this and I'm going to erase this in order to have space for it, is if you have metastasis in the bone, you really should be on Tvigo. Tvigo is a brand, is U.S. Enzymes brand, and if I could private label it, I would. Um, U.S. Enzymes brand of uh, green tea extract. So the, the catechin in green tea extract that's so important is the E.G., CG, that's how it's supposed to be written like that. That's a catechin and green tea extract that is uh, decreases and is one of the only things that has been shown to decrease the, the, um, the uh, interleukin um, six, which is an inflammatory cytokine that's found at the surface of the bone um, uh, especially when there's lytic destruction of the bone. So it's at the surface of the bone when there's lytic destruction. Um, it's an inflammatory cytokine and it is, um, uh, you want to decrease the, uh, the, uh, the level of IL-6 at the bone and EGCG will do that. Um, I used to say it was the only thing that was discovered. They actually did some new research on resveratrol, uh, and they found that it also acted in the same way. Curcumin, much less. Uh, EGCG from green tea extract and resveratrol both decrease IL-6 at the surface of the bone. So when there's either um, a lytic destruction of the bone or even osteoporosis, you really, the treatment is you first think of, oh, I have osteoporosis or I have lytic destruction of the bone. I need to increase my calcium right away and increase vitamin D. Well, really, the first thing you need to increase is you need to increase the things that will decrease the interleukin-6 at the surface of the bone, which is EGCG and resveratrol. We have several resveratrols. We only carry good resveratrols. We have multiple different resveratrols on our store. So, um, I like the resveratrol plus, um, and we private label it from uh, uh, Designs for Health, and it's a great product. But that's definitely, you want to be on that. And the reason why I'm talking about the TV go the US enzymes is green tea extract is the most polluted nutrient uh, across the whole supplement world. So of all the supplements that exist on planet Earth, Green tea extract is the most polluted with pesticides. Um, and US Enzymes is the most anal company with um, uh, looking at green tea extract. Now, I like a lot of different supplement companies, but US Enzymes is the most pure, um, especially 
for uh, green tea extract. So that's the only one I really recognize the TV go. Um, and you should really take about three of these a day. Um, so you don't need super high dosage. And the resveratrol plus, you will really want about three a day of each one of these. But you do have to spread them out because the half-life of resveratrol is very short. Great tea extract, the EDCG is a little bit higher, but the resveratrol is very short. So you need to spread them out through the day. That will be the best thing to decrease the inflammation of the bone to help you uptake any nutrients that you have. Certainly you want the right calcium. You don't need excess calcium. You certainly want vitamin D, um, but um, you need to decrease the inflammation. I am planning on traveling over Christmas to Puerto Rico. Hey, you know, if you are going to go to Puerto Rico, you really need to bring me with just to check out, you know, the place. It sounds like a wonderful retreat. Um, I have never traveled via airlines with my wife. Any tips on travel? I am reluctant to check my wife as baggage for fear of damage, um, even though the travel case is fairly robust. So what I've traveled with my wife a lot. Um, anytime I went on a seminar, anytime I you know went anywhere, I always brought my wife with. And I'll be honest, I I don't have a hard case, so um, I never brought it with a hard case. I think you don't have to worry at all if you're going to bring your hard case. Um, my only fear in I just wrapped it in a sweatshirt in my suitcase. My only fear was, what if they lose my suitcase? Um, it really wasn't a fear that it was going to get damaged. I wrapped it in a sweatshirt and wrapped that in another shirt. So I didn't feel like it was going to get shook around too much. I feared that they were going to lose my suitcase. So then I started just putting it in, in my carry-on. If you're going to bring your carry-on as the as the um the plastic um uh, um case that the wraith came in then you don't have to worry about it at all um going through um the tsa though they will ask you what it is you could just say it's a rife machine it's a light frequency machine it's going to go through x-ray they're going to see it's not a bomb um they're going to look at you weird um but you know, I've gotten every time I bring it as a carry-on, they I get pulled over, and so plan on a few extra minutes because they're gonna pull your bag off, and and you're gonna have to, you know, they're gonna look through it and do a swab test to make sure there's no bomb substance or something. Then they're gonna ask you, you know, I've had people not ask me what it is at all. They just said it, you know, just they, sometimes they're not very friendly. Um, the last time I went, they said, what is this? I said, it's a right machine. It's a, a light therapy machine. Um, and he, he like, whatever. I'm sure they get tons of stuff. They think that people are just weird. And I'm sure they thought that of me. So I wouldn't be worried about it. My only concern with traveling with the Rife is what if they lose my bag? Now, all the years I've traveled, i never had a bag lost. My wife did, but we did get her bag the next day. But I've heard of people that didn't have their bag for the whole vacation, you know, so then you don't have your right for the whole vacation. That would be my concern. So my hemoglobin is a bit low and the oncologists recommend doing an iron infusion as I am currently doing a low dose chemo pump. Um, and there is a chance it could drop even more. I do not want the infusion. What supplement would you recommend instead? Also, I have not received the resulted full genetic report as it did not come through either email. Thank you. Okay, I didn't read this question. Unfortunately, I don't read these questions before I actually am talking to you right now. So I will have to look back and see who sent this and, and get you your supplement report or the genetic report. The genetic report is like 250 pages now. Sometimes it doesn't end up attaching. So... Um, if you didn't get it, just let us know. Um, I So if your hemoglobin is low enough that they would recommend an iron infusion, it's probably below eight. 
Um, nothing supplement wise is going to raise your hemoglobin faster than doing an infusion. So I personally would do the infusion if it was me. That's going to raise your hemoglobin up. That's going to actually make you feel better, give you more energy. You're going to feel a lot better and be safer. If you're going to just take iron and do the iron artemisinin program, it's going to be very slow raising your hemoglobin. Um, you can do that as well, but I personally would do the infusion. But if you're like set against it, you don't feel like you're led to do that, then I would use our iron artemisinin program. And the iron that we use is called um, Clear Iron. It's our product. Um, and, and, uh, or Reacted Iron, the orthomolecular product. Or the Designs for Health has an iron, say it's the exact same thing. Remember, it's it's a Trax product from uh, it's the the good products. Where was that? Is um, the Albion and Trax? So the good supplements are using good supplement companies are using literally the exact same uh, base um, substance. Um, they might put other things in it, but it's still the iron itself, the mineral itself, is going to be Trax or Albion. Okay, some questions on the chat here. We're going to go way back to a lot of questions. You have my rife set for each night. If I use it earlier in the day, do I do it again that night for the same day and move, or move on to the next? No, I would just do it again. Just do it again. Otherwise, you'll get all messed up. <clears throat> also, should I be using my grounding pad with it? No. So you use your grounding pad with the ion pro wing. We haven't, but on a YouTube video, the guy says to use the grounding pad. We were told to use grounding pad for the foot detox. That's correct. Just use it for the foot detox. Do not use it when you're doing your overnight set. How do you know which influenza to use if there's so many to choose from? On the right, there wasn't a setting for 2022. That's correct. You realize that in any given year, there are nearly a thousand influenzas that are circulating through society. Uh, ridiculousness of getting a flu shot. They can only guess on which one is going to be the most virulent and they can only get about three different varieties in the flu shot, when you're going to be exposed to a thousand varieties of influenza, are you kidding? The flu shot is not effective. It's dangerous. You should not be getting flu shots, okay? This won't go out to the public. I'm just giving you my opinion. If you're still getting vaccinated with the information that's out there. You really need to educate yourself. That's my opinion. You can throw it out all you want. You can call me a quack. I consider that a compliment, but I am not um, uh, pro-vaccine. Um, what all the adjuvants that they're putting in vaccines and what the damaging things that that's doing to your body. How do you know which right program to use? You just got to try them and see which one seems to help you. There's no perfect way to know. Um, you, you can't. So just try the different influenza programs. You feel like you're coming down with the flu, do the cold and flu oncoming, do the different influenza programs. You're just gonna have to run through them. Same with your bacterial programs. Oh, there's, I feel like I got a strep throat. I got a sore throat. There's a whole bunch of strep programs. You just, you have to run some of them, just run them. Their frequencies, and if they are hitting the right thing, they're gonna have benefits. So just try them. Does Benmedazole go after red blood cells? I'm also on an oral chemo, chemo which is really good at killing them. My levels are low and trying to find ways to boost it. Uh, blood transfusion has been discussed, but not excited with that choice. Typically good at blood transfusion, your hemoglobin has to be below eight. Some clinics, hospitals require you to be uh, have a hemoglobin below 7.5 before they'll even allow you to do a blood transfusion. Um, so if you're hovering at 8.5 or 9, you might not even be in the category. 
From what I have read, I have not read anything that fed mendazol damages red blood cells, so I don't think that's causing any of the issues. Certainly, chemo does. Um, if your hemoglobin is above eight, and they're not even talking about a transfusion at this point because you don't fit into that category, look at the iron artemisinin <laughs> protocol on our blog. That's using iron with artemisinin together. Um, uh, because an issue with taking iron is iron can be a feeder of cancer. So if it's going to feed, if it, the cancer is going to gobble it up at all, and we want it to gobble up artemisinin at the same time, which could help kill cancer. I just read about some recent research about combining alpha lipoic acid and artemisinin to help kill cancer. Have you heard about this? There's a lot of research about lots of different supplements um, in cancer. So um, yeah, there's uh, tons of stuff about artemisinin, tons of alpha lipoic acid is highly, it's probably one of your stronger um, antioxidants um, uh, and uh, it can be very beneficial too. The only thing with alpha lipoic acid is that if you're doing chemotherapy, you really can't um, at least in a 48 hour window after chemo, you can't be on alpha lipoic acid because it's such a strong antioxidant. Yeah, artemisinin is not. Artemisinin is mainly an antifungal, antiviral, antibacterial. Um, you could certainly do that. It's certainly, certainly worth a try. I had the calcium question. They have the um, Zometa. That is why my calcium is low. <clears throat> okay. I gotcha. So that's the cause of the low calcium. Still, um, I would not, um, I'd still follow those recommendations that I can do. What's your thoughts on cysteine being the cause of my pancreatic cancer, as I'm told, with kidney stones? I read where they were starving this kind of cancer with cystinase, which breaks down the cysteine in the blood. Well, that's interesting. I haven't seen that. So I'd be open to looking at that. If you have any of those you know, research articles, feel free to email me. I appreciate seeing that. Cysteine is an amino acid. Cystinase is a protein that, uh, or excuse me, a uh, enzyme that breaks down cysteine, but maybe that's one of the reasons why high dose um, enzymes can be so good for pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, um, uh, intestinal cancers. Um, uh, so good comments. So I think first to ask that question, we do have you on some uh, higher dose digestive enzymes too. My functional doctor reviewed my Dutch test results. He ordered the test for me. You both noted my low levels of bad estrogen. Yay. But he noted my poor results on methylation. He wanted me to supplement to help with that. But I know you say no to methylated things. What do you suggest to support methylation pathways with poor results on the Dutch test? So just because you have poor methylated estrogens does not mean that you actually have a methylation problem um, just because they're low methylated estrogens. So um, that's, not, that's, that's not really indicative of a methylation problem. Where I would say your key thing with a methylated problem as far as any testing, objective testing is, is um, your, uh, if you do, uh, uh, complete blood count in a comprehensive metabolic panel would be uh, homocysteine. Homocysteine is your main thing that you'd look at for having a methylated methylation problem. So homocysteine is, um, if, if that's elevated, then we do, and, and your cancer is relatively under control, then do we talk about adding methylated nutrition. Um, because if your homocysteine is within normal range, 
um, and you have cancer, even if you don't have cancer, so let's pretend you don't have cancer, your homocysteine is within normal range, and you went and did a genetic test, and you have an MTHFR gene defect. So MTHFR is methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase gene. Um, that's the gene defect that most functional doctors will go, oh my gosh, we need to get you on methyl tetrahydrofolate uh, right away. We're going to put you on um, uh, MTHFR um, uh, uh, form of folate. We're going to get you on methyl um, uh, uh, B12, so methylcobalamin, because you have an MTHFR gene defect. Well, first of all, just because you have a gene defect doesn't mean that that gene is not working. And um, how can you tell if that gene is not working? But you, you look at other lab work. You might look at, um, in this case, with an MTHFR gene defect, you want to look at homocysteine. If your homocysteine is elevated, then you do need methyl groups. You do need some B vitamins and you need, do need some methylation. If you take methyl groups and you don't have uh, cancer at all, and you take excess methyl groups and you have too many methyl groups, it pushes another pathway called your biopterin pathway, which is the pathway, metabolic pathway, where you make all your neural transmitters. And you will make excess amounts of serotonin and dopamine. And dopamine issues, you can become very addicted to dopamine, right? And the serotonin issues in excess can make you literally kind of go crazy. So you could have these spurts of serotonin. You think serotonin is the happy um, neurotransmitter. Uh, only when it's in balance, excess serotonin can cause rage issues, uh, especially if you have any defects on that pathway. So um, I'm not in favor of looking at one test and, and diagnosing that. Certainly uh, looking at methylated estrogens, uh, it does not mean uh, if you have low amounts, it's not the, the methyl groups. Secondly, this is my opinion. You can throw it out if you want. But secondly, excess methyl groups, what methyl groups do, they silence genes and they can turn off other genes and you can end up with other issues. You certainly do not want to be turning off tumor suppressor genes. You need to be activating those as much as possible if you have a cancer diagnosis, really, if, even if you don't have a cancer diagnosis. So, most of our cancer patients are eating better. They're eating greens. They're eating, you know, um, you know, salads. They're eating better nutrition. They're getting plenty of naturally occurring methyl groups. So I wouldn't worry about that. The only time that I uh, trump not a cancer patient not doing taking methyl groups is if they have elevated homocysteine. So if you have elevated homocysteine then we need to add some more methyl groups to your diet to lower those homocysteine levels. To help detox gadolinium, he suggests two times a week EDTA, IV twice per week with a few weeks following MRI. Your thoughts on this? Well, EDTA is one of your is really your strong the strongest chelator in my book. So chelators are in my book are listed as mild, moderate, and strong chelators. Um, remember, chelation is the part of detoxification that I call phase zero detoxification. You have to make sure that phase one, two, three, four, five, six are working really healthfully. And most of our patients are already working on all those things. That's part of what you're doing. Um, so you probably could do EDTA chelation. A couple caveats to that. Do you have any mercury fillings? Well, if the answer to that is yes, then you absolutely better not be doing EDT, EDTA IV chelation. That's just crossed off the list. No. Um, <clears throat> the, so there are some negatives to it. I am not a great big fan of IV chelation because EDTA is such a strong chelator. It's been found to actually chelate the plastic out of the bag that it's found in, in the chelation bag and can cause plastic issues. So I'm not a big fan of EDTA chelation, but that's just my opinion. Um, a per personally, if I had acute arsenic toxicity, absolutely take I, uh, IV EDTA chelation. Um, um, but, um, you know, that's just going to be a personal choice. Um, I'm not completely against it. If you have any metals in your body, if you have uh, the nickel plate on your jaw, if you have 
mercury fillings in your teeth, you do not ever do uh, any EDTA IV chelation. What do you think of zeolite to help detox uh, gadolinium? Absolutely, zeolite is a moderate chelator. Um, you can do that even with mercury fillings. Zeolite is a great um, chelator and a binder. It can actually has actually a binder too, so it's great. I take buffered vitamin C powder from per capsulations, which is calcium ascorbate. Um, uh, is that a bad idea? No, I don't know what the milligrams of that is. I'd have to look that up. Um, there's a magnesium ascorbate and a potassium ascorbate too. I think that's just the buffering agents. So it's not like you're taking that for the calcium or for the magnesium, it's buffering it in your stomach. So the idea of a buffered vitamin C is it's, vitamin C can be irritating to your stomach. Um, it's acidic, it's ascorbic acid, and it can just be irritating to a person's stomach. So you buffering it with some minerals, um, helps calm it, helps you absorb it better. Um, in this case, you're not taking it. And, and these uh, minerals aren't in a high dose where you're getting a poor source of minerals. So I think that's just fine. I also take pure encapsulations, magnesium, citrate, malate, no. I think pure encapsulations uses albion and track minerals in their minerals. So I think you're fine with that. Um, how many clear multivin plus do I take? If I were you, because you asked the question about, uh, I would take four a day of those. Uh, how do we get a new insert for our rife cases? I have traveled with it so much, the bottom piece is getting kind of ratty and torn up. I need to replace it uh, the next few months. I'd con Do I contact True Rife? Yes, I would contact True Rife for this. And by the way, True Rife is updating their website. So if you go to look up, search True Rife, their, their website is actually down completely because they're doing a whole re-update on their website. It might take a couple of days to, for them to get done. We contacted them today. So they said it might not be till tomorrow night or Friday before their website is up. So don't think that they folded or something like that. I got an email from True Rife, and I think it said that there was a flu update. Maybe. So there may be a 2022 update, but again, they're True Rife, we're just guessing on the frequencies that are going to be valuable, but doesn't mean that those are going to be the, the specific frequencies of the virus that you're exposed to. Remember, I said there's like a thousand by the end of the year that are lying around in society. Is it better to rub black seed oil on my skin near my pancreas or to ingest it? Well, you're not going to absorb a lot of black seed oil through your skin. So um, definitely ingesting it would be a better way to get that for sure. In the store, the designs for health through resveratrol is Supreme, not Plus. I think our private label is Plus. So yeah, use the resveratrol Supreme from the leg for health. That is a good one. The resveratrox from orthomolecular is a good one too. So that is a good product too. Uh, okay, all right. I'm not getting great at holding my coffee uh, enema for the recommended time frame. Does this get better through practice? Am I still getting some benefit even though I'm not following it as recommended? recommended? Go back to the member site. I think it's the home page or one of the. It's maybe it's on the call. I don't know. Remember what page I put it on, but I created the Easy Pizza Coffee Enema protocol, and you could follow that. Um, uh, it is not um, essential that you hold it for any recommended time frame. Even if you're able to hold it for thirty seconds, you're still getting some benefits. Remember, the main purpose you're doing the coffee enema is to stimulate parasympathetics and doing it and you're only holding it for, you know, 25 seconds. You're still getting benefit of doing the coffee enema. So don't beat yourself up about that. 
Any news on the Navarro? Uh, somebody told me last week that they tried to order it and they still were not accepting orders at that time. You mentioned that you have to just try some of the right programs that come with the right. Does the scanner have help with that figure? No, not really, no, because you, know, you have to get really good at doing the scanner and it's not, it's still, it's far from perfect. Um, and I actually developed um, uh, the, the, the thing that Rife uses right now for their scanning. Um, but I'm still uh, far from a fan of thinking that you're going to get the exact frequencies through scanning. So there's an art to it. And um, I wouldn't. I would just use some, let's say if I had, a, a, you know, felt like I was coming down with something, I would be running the viral complex program. Um, you could run the cold and flu oncoming program, some of the flu programs. Uh, if you're dealing with a sore throat, I'd be running those programs um, um, for sure. Uh, you're, if you do some of the overnight programs, you're going to be hitting major frequencies that are going to be helpful. Uh, idea with the enema. I do a cup of warm water first, holding it until I need to go. Then I do the coffee enema. It helps a lot. A lot of people do kind of a pre-enema before their coffee enema to kind of clean out themselves a little bit, and then they can hold the coffee enema a little bit better. Sometimes that can really help with people. So trying some of those things can be really beneficial. That's the wonderful thing about this group is that we get these comments and you can learn from them. Having to be on first does cut down on the cramping, yes. Uh, where else can you be in a group when we're talking about coffee animals like this, uh, right? Some people are thinking, where else would you want to be in a group that's talking about coffee animals like this? But we're just that kind of people, I guess. Warm water plus coconut oil for pre enema. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, thank you for that. That's good. Coconut oil can be very soothing to the gut, too. All right, it's been about an hour, so I think we'll bid everybody adieu. Know that I'll be praying for all you guys. I love you all. Thank you for being a part of this group and supporting each other, praying for each other, and, and just wanting the best for everybody. Um, I will see you guys on Monday. Bye-bye.